I plan for six, but realistically, maybe we can fit only five assignments in this class. So um, I want to talk about two things first. Before I connect, I have a bunch of slides here to show you. We're moving on today to something called clustering, right? I'm sure everybody heard of that. Um, but before we move into clustering, I want to talk about two conceptual things. One of those things, th those two things, you, you're going you're gonna to hit them and hit them and hit them all the time when you work with data, especially with data that somehow came from nature. More about that later. But a lot of data has a natural feel to it, unless you create it with a MATLAB generating function, you know, here's a distribution. Sample data from that distribution. That's what we call artificial data sets. Those have exactly the properties you want, because you sample in the way you want. Say a mixture of two Gaussians, you sample from there, you get exactly a data that distributes like a mixture of two Gaussians. Apart from these data sets that are very uh, artificial, you're going to uh, encounter a lot the concept of a bulk or a sphere. And you already did in the KNN problems. Right? If you think about KNN, K near his neighbor, what happened with the, with the point Z? Everything we do about this point Z has to do with some notion of a neighborhood. Right? The way we created this neighborhood was to say, um, Include, include all the points within a radius, say. So the version can I'm talking about is the one that there is a magic radius, and this neighborhood is something like all the set points x with the property that, say, the distance between z and x is smaller than the radius. We, we have this version. <laughs> the other version was include the top several. Well, the one the include the top few, it's a little bit more complicated. What, what I want to point out here, the main concept I want to talk about, is the shape of this neighborhood. For k equal 10, maybe you can't really see a shape because you're talking about the closest k points. But if I pick a reasonably decent radius r, I could include potentially a lot of points in there. My point is very simple. Since this is an, a fixed R, it's not always fixed, but in general, it's a fixed R. How this neighborhood going to look like? All these points included here. Geometrically speaking, if it's a 2D, that's going to be all the points in a circle, right? That, that's obvious. What in a 3D? If I have three dimensions, it's going to be all the points in a sphere, right? A 3D sphere. And if I have 780, 40, like the, the, the images, the 70 images, implicitly, even though you didn't think about that way perhaps, you actually included all the images that are in a 784 dimensional ball or sphere, how you want to call it. <coughs> Does that make sense, what I'm saying? What happens if I go with the first version of KN and I say, hmm, no, no, I, I, I'm going to create the other version, which is consider all the points x um, such that x, the distance between z and x, is within top <coughs> distances from uh, x. By top, I mean the smallest distances, right? It's not really a mathematical way to write this. I mean, uh, this is not mathematical. It's very formal. The other version was take the k closest points. Right? So in that sense, do I get a ball if I take the closest k points? Is it possible that the closest k points are, three of them are very close, or four of them, right here, and then one of them is here, and one of them is here, and one of them is here and here, and maybe another one is like right here. That, that's like the last point, because there's nothing closer to it. Do I get a ball or not? Well, depends how you look at it, I think, right? You can say, okay, my points are here, 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 and here. 
But if I really want to express it like a ball, can I draw a ball that includes only those K points and nothing else? If I want to think of this neighborhood as a ball, a sphere, can I say there is a magic radius here, and if I draw that exact ball, I'm including exactly the K points and nothing else. Can I do that? Somebody, louder. Can I, can I think of the neighborhood this way? Okay, I draw this point, maybe it's too far away. Let's do some points in here. Those are the closest K neighbors. Can I draw a ball around here to include exactly those, but nothing else? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I can. I look at the last point. This is the K neighbor, right? And I draw the ball just to include that one, but nothing else, right? So if I draw the ball just, it's not really a ball what I'm doing here. You guys get the idea? Right? If I draw the ball between the K, what is it? This radius is the distance between Z and let's call this xk, right? This is z here, z and xk. And where is the k plus one point will be outside the ball, right? That is my purpose, to draw the ball between the k point and the k plus one point. Let's say the k plus one point might be here. That's xk plus one, right? So this here is what? This is the distance between z and xk plus one. I know these distances are in monotonic order because that's how I pick the point. The closest, the second closest, the third closest, up to I get to k. Now this distance, it's at least as much, I'll be a little unlucky here if they're exactly equal. If the k and the k plus one point are at the same distance, you can't really draw a ball that includes the k, but not the k plus one. But, but that's a, we call that a corner case or, or a degenerate case. Like in geometry, you get six points, they're all collinear, you know, bad luck. Let's not worry about these cases. Uh, in principle, it's possible to think of this as a ball. But in this case, the radius could be quite different from point to point, right? We talked about this, I think, last week. If you think about this way, some points may have the k closest neighbors really tight, small radius. Some other points may have the k closest neighbor a bit far away, big radius. The flip coin of that in here when there's a fixed radius is that some of those balls may contain a lot of points and some of those points may contain very few points. That's what I want to bring up as a concept number one, the concept of balls. This is very useful in data for certain algorithms. <coughs> Not all algorithms work by the ball, but many do, and for those it's essential that you have that intuition. It's very easy to write KNN or Bayesian networks or K-means, which we're going to talk about today, algebraically. And here's the pseudo code. You go ahead and implement it, run it. The, of course, you do that. It's not going to work right? sometimes. And then what? To figure out why it's not working, it's useful to get to the, to the underlying concepts like balls. The truth is KNN right here and K-means both are assuming that data form those balls. And when that's true, when the data form balls, they both gonna work okay, if not quite well. But if data doesn't form balls, then they're not gonna work that well. So every <coughs> algorithm, or almost every algorithm in machine learning and data mining makes some data assumption. We're going to talk about that in a few lectures from now when we say if you don't make a data assumption, you have an exponential space to search for data in the features. Because if you have like even few features, like 700 features, not that many. But if you think of them in an exponential sense, how many images can I generate with 700 features? It's an exponential number. So any decent algorithm will sooner or later make some assumption about the data. Think about regression makes the assumption that there is some linear surface that classifies black versus white, right? K and N, K means they make this robust ball assumption that says everybody that goes together or is classified together or similar probably fits in some sort of sphere. By the way, spheres in high dimensions are very non-intuitive. I know you all think it's all intuitive. 2D is a circle, 3D is a nice ball. How hard can it be 5D or 6D or 7D? Very hard. It, 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 there's a lecture in geometry, if you go to, to study geometry in college level, that teaches you that balls in high dimensions are very counterintuitive. 
for example, just to give you one, one flavor, quick flavor, this is digression from the subject. Balls of a certain radius, say fix the radius, r equal 10, right? I draw those balls, I got a circle of radius 10, I draw a 3D sphere of radius 10, 4D sphere of radius 10, so on and so forth. The volume of these balls as the dimension increases, but the radius stays fixed, the volume becomes zero. How many people think that's intuitive? That if you fix the radius but increase the number of dimensions, the volume of these balls slightly goes to zero. That's the absolute volume, not the relative, say, to a cube or something else. Very counterintuitive, those balls in high dimensions. And our problem, in fact, all data problems, relates to high dimensions. If we would have data in 2D and 3D, we wouldn't need to even study machine learning. Because in 2D and 3D, we can find very simple heuristic that will work very well. A lot of data problems are related to high dimensions. And balls in high dimensions are not so nice. For better or for worse, we do use balls a lot. A lot of the algorithms we do, including K and N and K means, have this underlying concept of a ball. So the fundamental question when things don't work for you, it's going to be, why is it my algorithm didn't work on this data set? Probably because it made some assumption like a ball assumption, and that assumption didn't really work for my 20 news groups documents. They don't really form a ball, especially in how many dimensions we got? 100,000 dimensions? Yeah, those balls in 100,000 dimensions are really nasty things. Like you cannot imagine those balls properly. They don't work the way you think they would like circles or spheres. So I would say right there that if, if things didn't work out that well for 20 news groups, probably that those balls in 100,000 dimensions have a problem. Okay? That's concept number one. Every time when you say K means K and N, Bayesian this and that, Gaussian mixtures, very important. Gaussian mixtures are extremely related to those balls. Uh, perhaps I should mention that right now. Why Gaussian mixtures tends to be related to balls? Everybody heard of uh, Gaussian distribution, I'm assuming? So uh, I'm going to draw a 1D distribution here, right? It has a what? Mean, right? So I don't want to talk about mathematics today. We leave mathematics for next week. For now, we say that's a distribution. When we say distribution, what's on the x-axis? Values. So these are values, or possible values. It's either possible or observed values, depending on how you want to think. And what's on the y-axis? The frequency. Frequency. So this is like age of a person, or salary of a person, or, or digit, or shape, or something. And this is how many of those things you've seen. Right? So Gaussian distribution says that there is some sort of average. And so this we call what? Mean. Or in statistics, we call it expected value. And there is the other parameter, which is kind of how wide the thing is, right? You can imagine that at the same mean, I draw one of these distributions that's very flat, close down, that's wide, or very spiky, right? I can have drawn this extremely spiky, or I could have drawn a very flat one. So the difference, they all three have the same mean, but the difference is right here that this one's more wide and this one's more narrow. How do we characterize this? Narrowness or wideness? Standard hmm? deviation. Right. But we, we're not going to call it standard deviation. We're going to call it confidence variance. And that's all confidence, standard deviation, variance are all related to each other. Again, I don't want to talk about math right now. We talk about math next week. But you should be familiar with how these Gaussian distributions work. If you're not, take the time before now, you know, before next week to figure out, OK, how those distributions work. And it's not just in one dimension. I could have drawn this in two dimensions. In two dimension would be like a bell, right? It would be like a, there is a mean in a 2D plane, and there is a surface that bumps up and down in all dimensions. And how wide the surface is dictates is dictated by the 2D variance or so-called covariance. All of that mathematics will come next week. 
why those Gaussian distributions are very related to balls? Again, this is conceptual. I'm not going to put any equation on the board today. Why is that? Common sense intuition. Why if data comes from a distribution like this, in 2D, 3D, 6D, 7D, 100D, it's likely, maybe, to form some balls? It's because it actually represents there's a clustering of data points towards the mean. So there's also a clustering of data points towards that point. Right. So that's not a very mathematical explanation, but it's the correct explanation. The Gaussian distribution assumes that the mean is also the typical value. In statistics, that means something typical, means most of the things are close to the mean. Not all distributions have this property. There are distributions, like extreme distributions, like reviews on Netflix. It's all one and fives. The mean is 2.5, but very, very few reviews around the mean, right? <coughs> so, so the mean, it's in Gaussian distribution, happens to be also typical. Means many values around mean. So that's why they form usually balls. Because if there is a mean somewhere of this distribution, and the data kind of falls into that distribution, a lot of points will be close to the mean, and a few points will be far away. And now, if you think Gaussians, Gaussians are, depending on the covariance matrix, they equal on both sides. But that's not necessary. You could have a Gaussian that's more white this way, but very skinny the other way. Suppose it's a 2D Gaussian, right? Uh, maybe I'll show you some pictures later on. I can have it perfect like a bell, like a church bell. That's round on all sides, right? It's nice. That means it has the same variance on both dimensions. But if I have a bell that somehow it's white this way, but very narrow if I look at it this way, now the footprint of that bell, it's not a circle. It's some sort of ellipse, right? So that's when the variance on the two dimensions is not the same. It's still a Gaussian. But maybe that's not a ball. It's more like an eclipse. So the first thing I want to talk about is this concept of a ball. And I strongly recommend you to think about those balls if you have the time, even for homework one. Why 20 news group doesn't work so well? Let's look at one of these neighborhoods. Let's see, does it look like a ball or not like a ball? If I increase k, you guys use a k equal what? Okay, what if I use k equal 50 or 100? Do I, look, do I look at these neighborhoods and I start seeing something that looks like roundish? Of course, in 784 dimension, you can't visualize it. You can't say print it so I can look at it. You have to figure out if I put a bigger K, like 50 or 100 in a neighborhood. I easily can get 100 images in the neighbors, right? Because I have so many images in there. So I look at the closest <coughs> 100 or closest 1,000. How do I estimate is this 1,000 form of ball? So now I'm back to neighborhoods. I say I've done this here, I to the closest k, but k equal a thousand. You got your test point here. You got the closest k images. I have this. I have as a set. I can't represent it really because it's 780 dimensions. How do I check if this forms a round space around the point z or not a round space? What should I do to see? Am I looking at something that's a little roundish or it's like something really weird? How do I find a way to determine the shape of this neighborhood? At, at least intuitively. I, I don't mean an exact formulation, but you know, the shape around Z in, in many dimensions could be really weird. Could be some snake like that. That's my neighborhood, right? Or it could be some intersection, two snakes. Or it could be a nice roundish kind of ball. These problems are part of a domain that's called data visualization. We even have classes about that now. It used to be part of this class and the machine learning class, but now there's a subfield of data which is called data visualization. Problem being, even in 780 dimensions, I pick 1,000 images or 2,000 images. I want to know how, kind of, how they look with respect to my point C. That's a particular task for this problem here. It's not trivial to come up with a way to visualize those things, right? To say, okay, it doesn't look like a ball or not. Um, I was going to say that uh, uh, if we kind of limit the distance and we put any two points, and the line between those two points kind of has to fit inside the, uh, the 
shape that you built, if it kind of goes outside the shape, then you just learn like a lot more circle or sphere. Yeah, but you can, like I said, you can always draw a sphere to include exactly those ones. So as far as can I draw a sphere that's a sphere and includes what I want? Yes, you can. That's guaranteed. The question is how stuff looks inside this sphere. This is coming down to a density problem. Of course, all of them are in this sphere. I know that's possible, but it may be that they're very dense in here and there's empty spaces around, so that's really not like a sphere. So this, it's, in terms of visualization, the data visualization people are concerned with this. In terms of theory, we call these density problems. So we have a space, in this case a sphere, and we want to measure its density and figure out if the uniform density or not. Those are complicated data problems. We're not going to solve them today. But this is the next step. If you, if you want to be more challenged, if you think this homework one was way too easy, I think it was a little easy, right? Uh, then you can start thinking about this. Do I have, if I increase the scale, how my neighborhoods look like for MNIST and how my neighborhoods look like for 20 NG? And I, I think the performance will come down to something related to that. Okay, that's concept number one. Concept number two I want to talk about is something you may have heard as you guys coming from very different countries. There's in all countries, but they have different names. Sometimes it's called chicken and egg problem. Anybody heard of that chicken and egg dilemma? Yes. What is it? Came first. Who came first? Which one came first, right? Because logically speaking, chickens come from eggs, and eggs come from chickens, right? And uh, you can't have one without the other, but on the other hand, you must have, have one to start the whole thing, right? If you have none, you, right? everybody understands that. I want to talk about that phenomenon in a very general sense. How about you trying to find a job? You have no experience. You didn't work, right? Anyway, it's your first job, and everybody says, sorry, we need experience. But you say, ha, I don't have experience, and I don't have a job. I can't get a job without experience, and I can't get experience without a job. So one must have come first, right, somehow, right? Um, how about you go to a party, and there's no party mood yet? In order for people to get a party mood and drinking, that somebody has to start the party mood, right? But if nobody starts, nobody gets in the mood. You, you ever been to a party when it's kind of like, everybody wants to party, yet nobody actually parties because it just doesn't start? Like nobody, everybody's like talking about the school or the jobs and it's like, okay, nobody's in a party mood. But as soon as something happens, some people start dancing, boom, everybody's on, right? It's still kind of a chicken and an egg problem. Or when you were a student, Everybody hates some subject where students. My most hated subject was chemistry, by far. Because it was deemed to be rational and logic, and I was to deemed to be the most rational logic student in the entire school, and I couldn't make any sense of chemistry. So, but everybody had this subject. You know it's a chicken egg problem. You don't like it, therefore you don't learn it. Therefore, if you don't learn it, you're gonna hate it even more, and you're gonna then, you know, not be able to learn at all, and you get this loop for two years, and then you're like, okay, I have no hope of making any sense of this thing, right? Chicken and egg problems. Now, I do want to talk a, a little bit more than a chicken and egg problem. So we have this story of who, which one is first. But I suppose something is first. There is an egg or a chicken. There's an evolution process, right? Once I have an egg and a chicken, I give it enough time, eggs create chickens, chicken create eggs. Eventually, the eggs are not gonna be the same eggs as in the beginning, and the chickens are not gonna be like the first chickens. The process is allowed some evolution. Same thing goes away with parties, right? I mean, by the end of 3 a.m., the parties look very different than they were looking at 10 p.m. with jobs and experience, right? Everybody has this exact problem. All of you will have this problem. I have no experience and no job. But once you start somehow with some experience or with some job, 10 years later, you guys are gonna be very different. Some of you will have very different experiences and very different jobs, even though you start in the same place. So there is an evolution of this process, and it's typically chicken, egg, chicken, egg, chicken, egg. And at every step, they change a little bit until they settle down to some point, until you find a job that's satisfying and you are good enough at it, and you kind of stay in that job for a while. 
let's call it like an equilibrium position, that there's not enough force to move the chicken and eggs out of where they are. Okay. Sounds familiar what I'm talking about? It's the kind of process that you cannot have it deterministically. Some recurrences have this form because there's a recurrence in mathematics or in algorithms. You can't really pinpoint a value, but if you have a value, you can determine other values out of it. Same thing in here. We have some algorithms, some data problems that can be framed very well in this, in this kind of mechanisms that if I have the chickens, I could figure out the eggs. And if I have the eggs, I could figure out the chickens, but I don't have nothing in the beginning. So I'm going to have to start with something, say the eggs or the chickens, and then allow the evolution from eggs to chickens to, to move on until it, it gets to some uh, equilibrium state or, or some, some evaluation state that I'm happy with. Anybody knows what I'm talking about in so data science? Convergence. Convergence is the equilibrium, but this, this kind of flavor of chicken versus eggs when I don't have neither the chicken or eggs in the beginning. Yes. So like you start with some point, like, like linear, uh, like, like for example, uh, optimizing some function, start with that, you, know, that you keep optimizing it, and then you reach. Oh no, that's different. What he talks about, that's very different than what I'm saying, is that if, if I have a function and I'm trying to find its root, right? That is the equation f of x equals zero, right? I'm trying to solve that equation. But the function is very bad, and I, I, I want to find one of these roots, and I don't know how. I think he's describing something like the Newton method. Uh, if I don't solve this, if i do not smart enough to solve this equation, I can guess an x, right? I can guess an x, and say, OK, what's the value of f? That's f of x here, right? But it's not 0. So I want to move towards closer to the 0. So I drew the tangent or something, Newton's method, and I get closer. And then I'm not getting at 0 just yet, because I found the tangent, right? And, but I'm, I'm closer now. I recompute f, and I drew another tangent, and then so on and so forth until I found the root. That's not the kind of problem I, I think about. Maybe could be some analogy. That's more like I'm not smart enough to solve that equation to begin with. There's no question of if I have no more mathematics, maybe I could solve it. In fact, some equations we do know how to solve, so we don't need any Newton's method for them. Yes? Is it related to some class string everything? Like k means that you need to have Yes, k means it's a, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg kind of problem in that sense. Uh, when I'm going to describe k means, which I think most of you already have seen or heard of, you're going to be like, OK, I did uh, eggs, which are the centroids, and I need the memberships without the chickens, and I can't get one without the other, so I'm going to start playing, oscillating between them. But the general class of problems, so this is not what I was talking about, but it's a, it's a good idea. By the way, you guys should know in principle how these Newton and gradient methods work, how to find the root without solving the equation. That's called mathematical optimization. It's pure mathematics, but you should know how to use it. If somebody says, call Newton method, I'm not expecting you to know how to implement Newton's method, but I'm expecting you to be able to go in Java, find the right function, and call it, and get the answer. So the, the chicken and eggs, this is not, you don't have to write this. Chicken and eggs problems for data are, uh, generally speaking, called EM class of algorithms. That's, that's used for a lot of problems. So we're going to use some for clustering, but EM has this chicken and egg kind of flavor. E stands for? Expectation. And M stands for? So these two things are the chicken and the eggs because to do expectations, we need the maximal function. And to do maximization, we need to have the expected values. And if you play out with them until you get them to some equilibrium, it'd be great to have some from the beginning, but you don't. So you have to start somewhere and then play with the EM steps until you get to some convergence. So those are the two concepts that we are adding. Uh, I'm not talking about mathematics. We're going to deal with mathematics next week. 
But the first important concept in this class, which is absolutely fundamental to all data, is the concept of similarity. You gotta, <coughs> uh, when you dig into the data, similarity is as much telling you as much as any other algorithm. So I, as I said before, in machine learning or data mining, similarity is absolutely fundamental to know why this patient is the same like this other patient. That was our first job, to get this similarity concept. Another way to expand your knowledge beyond the minimum, which is the homework one, is to play with different similarity functions. I'm assuming most of you just plug one of them, got the result, and you're done. There's many similarity functions for both text and data that you could play with to see if you get better results. Because the problem might be there. Every similarity creates a different kind of ball. They're all balls, but these distances change, there's a different ball. So you could play with, say, Jacquard coefficients or Euclidean distance, Minkowski distances, so on and so forth, to see if things change. That's concept number one. Concept number two is those balls, and concept number three is the alternating steps to get to where I want. So with that in mind, now we're ready to move to k-means. So k-means clustering. By the way, everybody knows what clustering means, right? Like grouping, right? Or, or getting stuff together. Uh, we're gonna call this k-means, we're gonna call it hard k-means. And uh, we will add a word to it that's, that satisfies intuition. Hard k-means, clustering is a general word that applies to everything. Instead of clustering, we're gonna use the word partition. I'm not saying clustering is wrong, but clustering is a very general concept. What goes with what? Cluster patients, or cluster emails, or cluster emails. The actual more, more common, more, more specific definition of this algorithm is that it's hard because next week we're going to have one that is going to be soft. And this is a partition. What a partition means in mathematics? When I say partition the students of this class into three groups, what does that mean? Everybody has to go to exactly one group, not to zero groups, not to two groups. So when you say partition mathematics, it means every single object has to go to one component of the partitions. Right? Partition a set, partition elements, part partition a graph, so on and so forth. So next week we're going to have that's not hard, and it's not going to be a partition. So if I am to guess right now what's going to happen next week, just a guess. Uh, how do we move this to next week? It's going to be k-means, but it won't be hard. It will be soft. And this will not be a partition. It will be a? If things now are not belonging to one category, or one group, or one sub, but possibly to many, how do I control that? I need a what? Instead of partition mathematically, I'm going to need what to control, what object goes to what component. Set. Set? No. I have all the students, and I say group them into three classes, but a student can be part of two classes somehow. It's not a black and white thing anymore. It's not every student goes to a thing. It's everybody can be part of everything now. How do I mathematically control such a thing? Somebody said distribution. Right, so today we talk about this and Wednesday, and then next week we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna soft on that. And even this name K means People sometimes call it differently, not k-means, in the soft version. That's going to be what? How do we call it? Sometimes it's called mixture. So you can call it soft k-means. That's a valid name or, or, or a mixture. Okay? But for now, let's worry about this hard one. Um, so I, I'm assuming most people have seen k-means. But if you haven't, no problem. It's easy. So what, what happens in k-means? Like I said, we're going to need chicken and eggs, right? 
So what that the chicken and eggs in K means? So we have the data points, so we have data points, of course. Let's say those data points are x1, x2, up to xn. And like before, we have them in a feature matrix. So x is a feature matrix. It's the same data like before. So once you have it from the homework one, it's the same vectorial format. Let's say this is, uh, what was it? N rows, the objects, times the dimensions, the features. Right? And we have, like in homework one, a similarity, right? We have a similarity between any xi and xj computed by a certain function. Uh, I'm going to call that kij, say, without specifying what the function is. Maybe this is the Euclidean distance, maybe this is the dot product, maybe this is the Minkowski, Jacquard coefficients, any one of these. There's hundreds of distances out there. I'm going to say there is one. Uh, that can be something like 1 minus a distance. That's like before in homework 1, we could either compute a distance or a similarity. They, the opposite distances are small when similarities are big and the other way. Some distances are more suited for matrices, like dot products. Some distances are more suited for text, like cosine or editing distance. So that's the same like before. We're not, we're not changing that. But now we're not doing K and N's anymore. We, we're not concerned with classification based on what's the neighborhood in the training center. Uh, what we are concerned is to group the data together. So our job task is to create K clusters. So this K is different than this K. Let's call this SIJ. So K clusters, that is a partition with K components of data space X. Um, so before I go into some math, uh, I'm going to say what is my, my, my common sense objective here. So uh, obviously, every xi will belong to one of the components. Uh, so every x, let's say nicely, for every xi, there is a component. And uh, let's say pi ij is one. Pi is a membership. This is membership. So pi j means one. Means xi belongs to component or cluster j. So you can say component or cluster. And if pi ij is one. Every other pi i uh, p is going to be zero for every p that's not j. So if it belongs to one cluster, it cannot belong to the other clusters. So these memberships are one and zero. For every data point i, there is exactly one cluster with the membership one, and all the other clusters have for that data point membership zero. So now. Everybody is a partition now because everybody has to belong to one of them. Visually, of course, I'm going to have, if my data set looks like in 2D, right? maybe I have a cluster over here, and a cluster over here, and a cluster over here, and some points are in here. And this, I'm going to draw this differently because they have a different membership. That's kind of ideal, right? To get exactly uh, the three clusters that you need to group things. But that, that's what we want in principle. So what are the my desires here? What's my goal? That that's a requirement. But I have goals. So ideally what would I like to happen once I have everybody in some component, right? 
I can decide how many components I want, K is up to me, and uh, I can say every point belongs to one component, I say K equals 10, for example, or five, I say every point is to one component. What would I like to happen? There's two goals that I have here. One is that inside each cluster, Cluster or component here means the same thing. Inside each cluster, I want what? Similarity, if, if xi and xj belong to the same cluster, right? Uh, then I want the similarity ij to be high. In other words, I want everybody who goes to the same cluster to be similar. That's, called, that, that, that's property number one, say goal number one. Goal number two, if the points are in different clusters, two points xi and xj are in different clusters, then I want what? So how do I say this according to my memberships? How do I say PI and 5J are to the same uh, cluster? The distance is close. That's what I want. But how can I express this in terms of this membership? Remember, this J is not this J. I, I should have written here XI and XT maybe. So this says. Data point I belongs to cluster J. How do I write this, that two points belong to the same cluster? Can you give me some equation that tells me that they belong to the same cluster? So let's uh, we'll write this down here. Find IP is zero for every P in IP. How do I write this? If I think of the sum for all components of pi IK times pi jk. I do a dot product. Every, every data point has a vector of memberships, right? Which looks like what? Zero, 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 except one value, which is one. If those two have the same component, what's going to be the dot product? One. Because Every, all are zero except one, but the same one will be one on both of them. So this is going to be one. But if they have different components, pi i k times pi sum over all clusters, pi i j, so pi j k. T. What did I say? T. So this will be zero because when one is one, the other one is zero, and when this one is one, the other one. So those are my two goals. Um, there is a mathematical equation that says, OK, how do you formulate these goals with mathematics? Okay, can you put a formula on the board that, that actually states it? I think that says the sum for all data points uh, let's see, maybe that's IT, IT. It says um, so that, that's specific for k means. I, I have to look to make sure I'm getting it right, but I'm, I'm trying to remember the formula right now. Uh, to do this for k means, so step number one. Before I do the formula here, I'm going to say k means. Now I'm moving to the algorithm. Requires. Centroids. Those are my x, the centroids. Yes? No, it's not predefined. It's actually changing with the k means, what I run k means. This pi, I should have said here, those are the chickens. This is one of the things that if I have them, I could do everything else well, but I don't have them. 
The other part is the eggs, which are the centroids. Again, if I have the centroids, I could compute the memberships easily, but I don't. So these are eggs. Centroids, you can think of it as the center uh, of each cluster. Easy, easy to visualize if you think of it as a 2D or 3D geometry. The center probably somewhere in the middle, right? So K means have the following chicken and eggs. That one of them is the centroids. What are the centers of my components of clusters? The other one, the chickens, are the memberships. Who belongs to what cluster? If you have one, it's easy to compute the other. If you have the centers, there's a pretty quick way to compute who belongs to each cluster. And if you have the cluster, the memberships, the pies, you would know which ones are the centers. So um, let's call this somehow, let's call them like in Gaussian mixture, mu k. Mu is the center of cluster k. This in here would be mu1, mu2. So how many people follow me so far? We want to get those partitions, and they're characterized by two notions. One is the center of each partition. The other one is the membership, who belongs to who in each partition. Uh, how do you uh, explain the membership? I'm not getting so the membership is, if I say I want three clusters in this class, the membership, I have the, the clusters one to three. The students are one to 70. Pi ij is for student i and cluster j. So i would be from one to 70, and j will be from one to three, because I only have three clusters. It would be either one or zero. For every student, there will be exactly one pi that is one, the rest of them will be zero. So how big is this pi as a matrix? Uh, how many rows are there? I, I, N. I, I, how many I, columns are there? K. Okay. So this pi is N by K. You can think of it as a matrix. And each row corresponds to a data point, so it's exactly only one one in it. But how about each column? Each column corresponds to a cluster, and then how many ones I have in them? How many points are in that cluster? How many ones are in this matrix total? N, because everybody has exactly one. Okay. Okay. Now, so there is a. I want to do two things. I want to characterize the global. I can write those two goals with a mathematical equation. But I also want to see, as this question, if I give you the centroids, could you figure out the membership? Or the other way, if I give you the membership, can you figure out the centroids? So let's write this as a mathematical goal. We call it objective. That's, by the way, a very standard name for machine learning and data mining to say, find the objective tells you that if you find the minimum or maximum of it, that's exactly the best position you can be in. So this objective, I think, is you want the sum, uh, what it is, for, let's see, I think this is the sum for every data point. Uh, something like the pi ik uh, times the distance. I'm going to use distance here, but you can replace with similarity. Distance between xi and the centroid k. This is for every i and k. What do I want to happen? For every one, of course, for, for a lot of those pi k's will be zero here, right? And those will not matter at all. But for the ones that are one, 
meaning that point belongs to the cluster, what do I want the distance to be? Low. So I want the minimum of this thing. Notice that this requires memberships, pi i k's. You can't compute this in advance because you don't have the pi's, but also requires the centroids. So that's why it's a chicken and egg problem. If I would have one, I could get the other, but I have neither the centroids nor the memberships. So this is specifically 2k means. You could imagine clustering going differently with a different objective, but this, uh, you'll see it sometimes written. This is for Euclidean distance, will be minimum of, if I use Euclidean distance for all ik, pi ik, that's a membership, it's one or zero. Times now, if I write the Euclidean distance, what do I do? What is the distance between xi and mu k? The sum for all dimensions, right? X i d minus mu k d squared. Is that the Euclidean distance? That's it. Component by component, different square sum up. So typically k means, I think, it's mostly defined with Euclidean distances. So in the books or slides, you might see Euclidean distance. But for what I care, especially for this week, is understanding how the objective works independent of the distance that's being used, or similarity. I can put one minus similarity and get it work with cosine or dot product or whatever else I want. Okay, so that's my objective. Uh, now, there's an optimization problem Find me the minimum means find exactly what? The distances are fixed as a function, but I have to figure out the mu's and the pi's, right? Because in the beginning, I don't have the mu's and I don't have the pi's. So I can't really optimize this in the sense of finding the root or finding the maximum. It's a back to the chicken and egg problem. I have to, how, how, how do I find something like that? I mean, how do we solve chicken and egg problems in general? How do you solve the I have no experience and no job? How do you start, 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 start the thing? Start 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 you start with some mules, right? Here's my eggs. And then figure out the chickens. And now I have some chickens. Figure out the new eggs and keep going until you're happy, right? That's what's going to happen to your job. You're going to start some job, not the one you want, right? And then you're going to work on it, get some experience. That experience will allow you to get a better job and then more experience. That's what you're going to do, right? So and now moving towards an al actual algorithm. So I want, I want to now have an algorithm. But I still follow intuition, not rigorosity. This is hard k means, and it's a partition. So I have to guess or start somehow with, I'm going to assume k, the number of components is fixed in advance. That's not always true in practice. But let's just say for now it's fixed. I know k equals 7. Right. Let's start with a bunch of x mu 1 centroids. So somehow I have to guess those, or somebody has to give it to me, or something. I have to start somewhere, right? Uh, I'm going to assume, actually that's an assumption in all k-means to make it work, that those centroids, every one of them, is a point in the same space. as x. So if x was an image, all the x's were images with 784 dimensions that were black and white or gray, right? Right? Yeah. We assume the centroids are also some sort of images with 784 dimensions that are black or white or gray. If the data were documents with words, right, uh, of many classes, we assume that the centroids are also documents with words with the same number of vocabulary, kind of the approximately the same length. Like, it's not just the kind. 
the, the words versus images. If those are news articles, the length of uh, one any document in 20 news groups say it's what's the average length in there? 300 words maybe, something like that? We're gonna assume that those centroids are also about 300 words. Out of a sudden, we're not gonna create a centroid that's not looking like a news article. It's, you know, Tolstoy's War and Peace, a gigantic book, right? If we see the data being news articles with 300 words, we're going to create centroids that are also 300 words. And there are be, be, good techniques to do that. For now, we just say somebody somehow gives me those centroids that are reasonable points in the same space. If you think about visually, even though you're not getting initially the centers you want, so we're not getting those centers, I get maybe some point here, and some point here, and some point here within the same space. If, if I can visualize the data in that space, the center should be around there. It should not be completely off weird points. If there are images, that image should look like a three or like a seven or like a five, or maybe like a five and eight mixed together or something. That's okay, but it shouldn't be, uh, you know, a bunch of ships on the ocean if, if I start with images that are digits. Okay, so I start with that. And now I have to compute the pi's, pi i k for every i and every k from the center. Right. And then once I have pi's, I can go back and compute what? Let's say init. That's a step where we just initialize the process. Compute the centroids. This is from news, and this is from pies, right? It's exactly the kind of chicken egg problem I talked about. And uh, I could redo this a few times, right? So this is really a loop. Because I get Presumably, every time I can compute one from the other, I get better at getting better memberships, then better centers, better memberships, better centers, better memberships, better centers, until eventually, until I have some convergence. Uh, there's a criteria, right? We're not gonna go into the math of what that is for now, but somebody said, when things get stable, like you, typically this means in, in, in common sense, not mathematically, it means uh, no changes observed. Effectively, I get to a point where if I compute the center rates, I get the same center rates as before, and therefore if I recompute the pies, the memberships, I get the same memberships as before, and I call it, I call it a day, even though that may not be a good clustering, at least by this method, I cannot make any advance, right? If I see no changes, even though I'm not in the place I want to be, by continuing doing this, I won't do anything. That's it. That's k means. Easy, right? I mean, did you guys know this already? How many people knew k means before? Hands up. Oh, about half of the class. Right? It's much harder than it looks, by the way. When you're going to have to implement it, the, 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 the devil's in the, you know, details. Yes. Uh, what if there are three points, let's say, A, B, and C, which are highly similar, yes. and if two of them are selected as the starting centroid, so assumed to be a centroid, then C is going to be similar to them. So what would be the value of uh, pi for C? Right, you, you would think, so first of all, you would hope that somehow, even though the initialization is bad, yeah. he's talking about what if two centers are extremely close to each other. Uh, you'd hope that after a few iterations, because this is a loop, yes. that doesn't happen anymore. Data must have some sort of density property to break that, and typically it does. That's not usually a problem in K-means. But then, uh, I think the other question he's asking is, how do you actually do this? Right. So I say compute. It's easy for me to say because I don't have to do the homework, right? You do. So how do you do it? How do you, e even the centers are, suppose, very close to another. It's in principle. How are we going to compute pi's if I have the centers? 
we go back to this objective and say, what do I have now? So um, I think computing pi here, we're going to call this E step. We're going to call this M step. This is just for notation. You don't have to associate E with expectation right now. Okay? For right now, or maybe it's the other way. I'll fix this later on. For right now, you don't have to think of in your head, oh, expectation, what does that mean? No, just call it step D and step M, okay? So what is uh, compute pi from news? Again, I'm assuming here the mu is fixed, yes. Right, so what he's saying intuitively, I have the mu's, here are, uh, let's say, mu1, right? Here's another one, mu2, and I have, I have mu3 here, okay? mu4, and uh, mu5, k equal 5. How would I pick, how would I choose pi's? So pi's it's for every data point, right? Yeah. Every data point has a membership with only one, one, and everything is zero. So essentially, figure out the pi means figure out which one is the one, right? So pi ik is being one. How do I decide, here's my point, uh, let's say z. Here's my point z. How do I decide which one is the ones and which one is the zero? In other words, to which cluster it belongs. The clusters are one, two, three, four, five. I have the centers. I have a point Z. Where do I go with it? The closest, right? So I go here. I say this is one if what similarity between Z and mu K is minimal. Maximum. That's distance. Distance, if I use distances, the distance between Z and that K is. Now what I want you to do at home is to figure out for this exact, now th that's a nice intuition, right? That's a nice story, but it's not a mathematical proof, what he just said. What I would like to do at home and let us know how it goes by Monday next week. If I'm using exactly this function, that's not just a general function, but exactly the, sometimes this is called the least squared distance, right? least squares, least squares. Sometimes it's SSE, right? Sometimes it's called the regression objective. Sometimes call it Euclidean distance, they will do the same thing. Is this sum of squares, right? What I would like you to do is to say, if this is my objective that I want to minimize, and the mu's are already fixed for me, right? Because that, that's our problem right there. Right here, we have the mu's. Mu's are not changing right here. I would like you to prove that in order to minimize this function by taking derivatives or whatever you do to minimize it, this procedure, getting the closest, is actually realizing that minimum. It's not just a guess that makes sense. If you do k-means particularly with this distance, Euclidean distance, then when you, assuming mu's are fixed, you cannot change them. The only thing you can change is the pi's. Then, and you are restricted by pi's being all zero except one to be one. That's a hard membership, not a soft membership then the only way to, the way to choose the pi's to minimize this function mathematically is exactly to move each point to the closest. That could be, if we decide to do an exam, that's my first candidate for an exam question. Use k-means with Euclidean distance. Prove that in m-step, or yeah, in m-step, 
if mu's are fixed, this particular procedure actually minimizes that function. Now, that's not a global minimum. Why is not a global minimum? Because mu's might change too to get to the global minimum. This is just a local minimum that says if mu's are given to me, the best I can do in terms of pi's is this. Get each point to the closest mu. And that mathematically we can prove that's going to minimize this as far as we can without changing the mu's. Who's with me? We're going to do this at home? Right? OK, what the other step is? How about compute mu k's from pi? So now it's the opposite. Now somebody gives me the memberships, but no centers. So if I think of students grouped into five classes, somebody says the following students are in group one, the following students are group two, the following students are group three. So now the pi's don't change. Pi's are fixed. But it's my job to compute the mu's. So how would you do that? What's a mu? Memberships are fixed. Who do you think is mu k? Average of all the numbers. Average of all the points, right? So it's the average of what? All the pi. X i with the property that X i belongs to pi i k is So I'm averaging the xi points that belong to that cluster, which I know because pi's are given, right? So mathematically, how do I write that? I mean, that's a, my own formula here. But if I want to write it mathematically, how do I do it? Sum, right, for all data points of xi times pi i k. k is fixed because I'm, I'm computing that centroid, centroid k. So this will include only the ones that are in that cluster, right? Because everything that's not in the cluster, it has a zero here, so it, would, it won't matter, right? The only ones included are the ones in here that have pi k equal one. And now to get an average, that, that's kind of the sum of everybody in the cluster. How do I get an average? Divided by the number of points. Divide by? Number of points in that particular cluster. Sum of all the data points from that cluster. Pi i k. Will that tell me how many points are in the in the cluster? Because yeah. that's how many points have a one in that cluster. Yes. Okay. Now there is an assumption here that's very important to note, and many people forget about it when the right k means. Average has to be possible. Not all data points come with features formats that you can just take the average of them. Right? Think about patients. One of the features might be race. You know, he's white, he's black, he's Spanish, you know, Indian, Chinese, so on and so forth, right? But you can't really take a bunch of patients and average the race component. What is it? Like it's not, it's, if it's numerical, then you can average it. But even if it's numerical, it could be misleading. You know what I told you uh, two weeks ago when people say the colors are red, blue, green, and they map it into 0, 1, 2, and then when you take the average, you get 1.5. And uh, in some cases, if they like it, that makes sense. The average is actually in a spectrum. If the colors are really from 0 to 255 or something like that, you take an average. Colors do average, actually, right? Less red, more green, you get more brown, right? But some, some of these things that are mapped numerically sometimes don't average properly, like races or, or uh, locations maybe, you know? If the average between Boston and New York is in the Atlantic Ocean. So it's not, not a valid location for a house, right? Computing the average location of a house and then averages could be on top of a mountain or on, on the ocean, who knows where. If you do this, which a lot of people do without thinking. You have to ask yourselves, can I really average those values? <laughs> in most cases, you can, like in pixels. Maybe word frequencies. Word frequencies can average them. If I look at the word you know, Northeastern, and I have a bunch of documents, some of them have the word Northeastern. Zero times, one time, two times, three times. Can I say a bunch of these documents? Average the frequency, you get 2.7. That makes sense for the word Northeastern as an average frequency? It does, right? In many cases, it will, but in some cases, it will not. You have to ask your question, is the average possible? 
And even if it's possible, does it make sense? And like before, we want to prove mathematically that for this particular function, if somebody fixes the pi, the way to minimize the function is for mu to be exactly the average of each cluster. So I know, I know that makes a, a lot of sense intuitively, but I want a mathematical proof that says if pi's are fixed, the average is exactly that. That proof you already have seen. You must have seen it. It's the same proof that says regression uh, has a certain property. The way they prove regression is the same proof that they prove the, the means of Gaussians. You know? Everybody knows that if I want to estimate the mean, I do what? I get a bunch of points, sample, and then do what? Average them, right? That's going to be an estimator for the mean. The reason that's true is because the average of the points that belong to the cluster minimizes this function. So we're going to need two proofs for k-means that are going to be part of homework two. That is, each one of these steps minimize that objective given that the other one is fixed. The problem with k-means is now, if I loop this thing, am I getting somewhere with it or not? Sometimes we do get to a nice clustering. That's back to this question. Suppose I start with really bad uh, centers. One is here, one is here, too close to each other. If I do this thing, can I hope that my center eventually moves to the right place in the clusters? Sometimes they will, and sometimes they will not. The reason whether they do or not has to do with this first thing we talk about, these balls of the data. If data looks like balls, very likely this algorithm will converge to something good. Maybe not the best, but something reasonable. If data does not look like balls, even if we pick the right centers, it's still a problem. It's going to try to figure out balls around it, but there are no balls in this data. So that's going to be in the slides I want to show you. Now, can we do better here? I mean, guess start. OK, we didn't say how to do it. How would you do this, guess start? I want some simple but reasonable options for how do I start to center it. Uh, we didn't talk about that. Yes? Can we pick like the uh, data points in the training set? But how do you pick them? Randomly. Random. So one option, that's not bad actually. K is fixed. So I pick K points from the data set at random. Another option? That's called farthest traversal, right? Uh, for the farthest traversal that says, pick up first point at random, perhaps. But even that part may be not be done at random. You don't want to pick a random in the middle. But what he's saying, if you pick a point here, I have the distances, the similarities. I don't want to pick the second point at random. I want to pick as far as possible. Now, as far as possible, it's likely not to be a centroid because it's at the extreme of the data set. But it's good to start that way, right? Because imagine, if I pick a point here, that would be my point one, my centroid one. And I pick one here, that would be my point two. And then the third one would be here at the extreme. Even though they're not the centers I'm looking for, the initial partition of points is likely to go well. Right? Because be all the points that go here, all the points that go there, all the points that go there. And now once I have a good partition, the next step is going to compute proper centroids. So I don't have to worry initially to pick the right centers. The, the points that I want to pick is not necessarily the right centers, but rather what to create a nice partition of the points. Now, geometrically speaking, how uh, if I really have a 2D? What determines geometrically if a point is closer to here or to here? Geometrically. There is a line between a perpendicular line on the middle, right? And every point that's on this side of the line will belong to this cluster because it's closer to this than to that. And every point that's in here, it's closer to this. Similarly, 
between those two points there is a line right in the middle that says that says everybody on this side of the line it's in here and everybody on this side of the line is in here and similarly between these two points there is a line in the middle that says everybody closer to here goes there everybody closer to here goes here these lines form a partition of the space, of course. And uh, everybody in this region would belong to this cluster. Everybody in this region would belong to this cluster. Everybody in this region would belong to this cluster. And sometimes they'll close. If I have more centroids, uh, suppose I have another centroid in here, I'm going to have a line now between those two, right? And a line now between those two. So I'm, I'm going to get something like So you, you can form all these kind of Venn diagrams that way, where you partition by the points are given, the mu's, you partition the whole space into the region that's closest to each one of them. That's a geometrical visualization of what KM is going to do if you have a few dimensions, two or three. So we're not ready to go into the details of K-means, because we need to understand the main principle first. But then to implement this, there'll be a lot of details, like how do I really pick centroids? How do I know I'm done? If you get stuck, some people start from the beginning, say, throw it out, this didn't work, you know, try a different uh, initialization and run it again. Uh, the average that we take, you uh, should it be a point that is, that is a data point? Yeah, so the data points are X size. And they only average the ones in that cluster. So these are ones or zero, right? Uh, how uh, how can you be sure that the average is a data point? Right? right. So that's that's a thing. The averages are not gonna be data points yeah. in the set. Even though I go these images, when I compute the k means for the images, I'm gonna get something that looks like an image because the average is possible. <coughs> Like, and I can take those 784 pixels across my cluster and average them. I'm going to get a vector of 784 values between 0 and 255. So I can plot that as an image. The problem is it may not look like a 3 or 4 or 5. It may look like who knows what. Absolutely true. In K means there's no promise that, that the averages are those points. Now, you could force that. You could say, I compute the average. It still has to be possible to compute. And then I don't use that average. I use the closest point in the cluster as the average. So I really have an actual patient or email or image as a center, not a something that's not really a patient. That's more like domain specific. Doctors may not understand the average of patients, but if you tell them the center of this component or partition is this patient, it's easier for them to think about it. So you could. With some pro assuming some property, say I don't want the average, I'm going to compute the the closest point to the average and use that as centroid. In most cases, it'll be close enough, so it won't matter that much. But I think the the basic version is leave it as an average. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be part of the data set. The computation of all this, as long as algebraically is possible, it won't bother us the fact that the average is not part of the data set. All right. So we're going to have to iron out next time on Wednesday some details about, OK, how do we actually run this stuff? But I hope everyone is on board with the main principle. Centroids, membership. Centroids, membership. And of course, next week, we're going to relax this notion of membership to not be 0, 1, to not be hard. Right? It'd be like, OK, you have 80% chance to go there, 10% chance to go there, 5% chance to go there. So now it's a soft membership. And that becomes a more complicated problem. Um, so I would like to connect these uh, this slides I have. Um, there's two other algorithms that I'm concerned about. This is the start of any unsupervised learning, this clustering algorithm. What would be another way to do clustering? So this is obviously a very clear way to do clustering. I want to do hard partitioning. So I'm not in a soft world yet, but I want a different algorithm. Anybody knows a different algorithm that doesn't work like that? Yes. I'm thinking like if I something like, like what? 
Yeah. He must find a tree. My name is Bantry. Like, there is a level that is like, like it, it is a graph, like it is a tree. I don't know. But how do I start? You say merge clusters. I need something to merge, right? Take the two closest points together. I take, look at all the points, and I say the ones that are the most similar, group them together. Something is more similar, group them together. Start the more similar, group, 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 group. And every time I group, I replace the two points that I grouped, or three points, with the group. So next round, instead of asking, is this point similar to some other point or some group, I'm going to have the group. Right? So I can think of that procedure. Again, no details today. I can think of that procedure. Here are all my points, right? Some of, I, I have the similarity, if you, if you guys did homework one completely, you computed the similarity between any two points. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to choose the closest similar two and say, I'm going to replace those two with one group. From now on, this is a greedy procedure. So every time I group two things together, I'm never going to go back and break that group. K-means is not like that. K-means may do in some round some partitioning and change its mind the next round. Next round. I change the centroid, the points will fly in a different way. In here, once I pick two points to group, that's done. And then I pick those two points, and I always replace, I still have the rest of the points, but those individual points don't exist anymore. The group is now what exists. You can think of it as a group now. And then later on, I may say, these two points are the most similar now. Or I may say, this point to this group is the most similar. And I now have three points now, the two in here and this one forming a group. Every time I form a group, I'll stick with that. I'll never go back. Eventually, everybody gets clustered, right? You can have that once you have a cluster. You can compute a centroid if you like. I, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about this procedure that's very much called bottom up. Group the ones that are most similar and always replace the individuals with the group. And then ask again, what's more similar? Whatever's more similar, group them, replace the groups of the points, whatever you have, with a bigger group, and keep going. Eventually, everything is going to be grouped together. But the clusters are given the structure of this tree, if you like. The different trees means different way of clustering. So this is bottom up a hierarchical clusters. Now, to get clusters, I don't go all the way to the top. I mean, even if I go all the way to the top, there's only one cluster. I need to cut this somewhere to get clusters. The moment I cut it, I add this and this and that. The higher I cut it, the less clusters I have. The lower I cut it, the more clusters I have. Now, I didn't say the details. The details are in the similarity. When you group two points, you ask for the minimum similarity. But the points will go away pretty, pretty fast. So eventually, I'm going to be left with groups of points. Now I have to be able to measure similarity between this group and that group, or any other group. Because it still goes by whoever's the minimum similarity gets grouped together. Not an obvious way to say, even though I get the similarity between points, <coughs> that's the initial matrix you computed in homework one, now that I group those 100 points together and these other 50 points together, what is the similarity between this group and that group? And you have to maintain the scale. If you allow those similarities to go up and down with the volume, how many points are there, is going, everything is going to get messed up. Because some will be still points, while others will be big groups, potentially. Right? You have to have the similarity, whether it's between groups and groups, or groups of points, or points and points, be on the same scale, so they can compete. Otherwise, if you say the similarity grows to the number of points, the bigger groups will always be more similar with other big groups than the points themselves. So you need to be careful how to define similarity per groups maintaining the same scale. 
Now, this is easier than EM because it doesn't have this flavor of going back and forth between unknowns like we had here, pies and mirrors, uh, right? This is very straightforward. Once you decide the similarity function and once you decide what the group similarity is, that's just a, a mathematical formula. This is a straightforward algorithm, right? Pick the minimum similarity or maximum similarity between objects you have, group them. Pick again the maximum similarity, group, 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 group. There's no randomness in there. But it may be computationally inefficient. It's not the joining that's inefficient. Joining is efficient. Every time I group two things, that's easy. It's this idea that I have so many groups or points, and I have to find the two most similar ones. And there's a lot of similarity values there. How do I determine at this step what are the two most similar ones? So you need an efficient way to keep track of all the similarities. But apart from that, this is a more straightforward algorithm, I think, than k-means. So that's one idea that we could do for clustering, hierarchical clustering. And uh, I, I'm not so smart, I think of it bottom up, but smart people can think of it top down. What if I start with one big group and I'm starting to think how can I break it into two bytes? That's the first branching of the three, breaking into, right? And then once I'm here, like before, it would be greedy. So once you decide to split, it's a done deal. So you have now two groups because you split once. Now, how do you decide to split this group further? Or whether to split or not split? Anybody knows some algorithm that would kind of do that? Decision tree is to go top down, right, as opposed to bottom up. I think for me it would be easier to implement it bottom up. What's another idea? So that's in our here clustering. What else? Everybody played 20 years ago with Windows 95 paint program with a can that you drop the can somewhere in the drawing and boom, it colors the whole thing blue. Everybody remembers that? Yeah. Well, it was a fun thing, right? When you, when you get bored, Games don't work, computers don't work, nothing was working, you play with that can, right? And it's, but it didn't color the whole thing. When you put that blue can on somewhere, how did it, did it cover? How, how, how much it went? How did it know to stop? Do you have a drawing of some person or something and then you put the blue can, it only colored what? Until it found the boundary. So it colored the point that you put it on and all the pixels that have the same value around it until it found pixels with a different value and then it didn't color. How about I do that for clustering? Remember I have a similarity function? So I, I don't have blue points and white points, but I have a similarity function, right? So I know who's similar to who. So I put a threshold that says, if anybody's that similar, it's considered the same color in the sense of pain. And everybody who's not that similar, the distance or similarity is beyond that threshold, is considered a different color. So I put the paint, the can paint on him or Bishwa you know. He is in cluster one. <laughs> how now, following the paint program in Windows 95, how do I determine who else is in cluster one? If I already say, you are in cluster one, who else is in cluster one? Everybody who's similar with him within the threshold will also be in cluster one. But now I have more students, maybe she's in cluster one and she's in cluster one. Now what do I do? Everybody that's similar to them within the threshold, <coughs> even though they're not similar with Bishwajit, they also cluster one. Everybody who's similar with anybody that has the new color or cluster one, becomes part of that cluster. And this keeps going and going and going and going until I hit the boundary, which is I colored everybody cluster one or blue, but nobody else is close enough to the blue part. This is a very different algorithm that I was to discuss. It says, once you decide make a membership assignment, he's in cluster one. Everybody that's close to him or anybody else in cluster one also become cluster cluster one. And that keeps going, because the more I add people in cluster one, there may be more people similar to them now that becomes cluster one. That's exactly how the paint went. 
on the on the screen until there's nobody similar to cluster one. That's cluster one. So now I start cluster two. So the similarity threshold will be the same. Typically, yes. Let's do the basic version for now. I fixed the similarity threshold. And I would like to show you some slides. We're going to have to talk about those slides more next time. This last one? Yeah, I'm going to show you some pictures in a second. Uh, K means works for balls. Because the cluster, because of these two procedures, they're always going to find something globalized. But this other algorithm works for whatever boundaries you have in a day. So I'm going to put the slides online. And um, we're going to talk about more next time. Like before, the, the main thing here is going to be um, you implementing the homework questions. So we didn't fix the. I, I asked somebody to look into the projector thing, but you know how those things are. They take three months to fix it. So by that time, you won't. Uh, um, So I'm going to go quickly because a lot of the things here for now, I, I, I still want to give you two days until Wednesday to think about the intuition of those things before you go into formulas and all that. Um, let's see. Oh, we have this, this is part of the work we've already done before. We have distance of similarities. I'm going to say this again. I know I've said it already 20 times. Distance and similarity is an essential notion for all machine learning. But if I don't have labels like in here, I mean, we do have the labels for these data sets, but in unsupervised machine learning, we don't use them. So decision trees would have to be modified to not use the labels to do clustering, right? I'll have to go by some sort of similarity criteria, like information gain or something like this. Uh, they're critically unsupervised machine learning because I can't go by the labels. The only thing I have to go by is how similar the data point is without the data point. Um, so there's a lot of terms and definitions of, uh, of what is centroid hierarchical versus density based versus so on and so forth. We'll go through this as we understand more. I want to first understand the intuition of the algorithms and then call it names. So let's see. Here's the hierarchical uh, thing that I showed you. The idea is you connect the closest two points together, and you can see how initially every point is a cluster. That's how you start. And you start grouping the ones that are close nearby. And here, the similarity is depicted as a geometrical distance between them, right? So the closer they are, the more similar they are. And eventually, you're going to grow these clusters into one cluster. That's the top of the tree here when I join everybody together. And I have to decide where is a good, depending on my actual problem, what is it that I am uh, trying to achieve here. If I have the K, I know how many clusters I want. I could go down the line until I have exactly K clusters. If I don't, I have to figure out what's good. We didn't talk at all about evaluation. So. Uh, evaluation is simple if we have labels, and you're going to have labels in this data. We're not using the labels for clustering, but suppose I cluster those images. What would be a common notion whether my clustering worked or not? What would be a first a common, a, a nice K to try for images? Ten. 10, because there are 10 digits, right? And we know that, so let's try K equal 10. How are we going to say clustering work extremely well? What does that mean? Every digit that had the same label went to this one cluster, right? And no trees didn't go to different clusters. That's because we have the labels. We can do that evaluation. What if I don't have labels? How would I say it worked? I could go by that measure right there, right, and say if the similarity achieved is very, very small, right, Perhaps the two things together, the, two, the closest, the, the objects in the same cluster end up very, very similar. 
but it's much harder to do evaluation without labels than with labels. Okay? So here's the example of the density, the, the last thing we talk about, density-based scanning. Uh, if I have data that looks like this, <coughs> look how bad this is for K means. K means, remember, is going to try to find a sphere. No matter how hard you try, you can find many spheres if you increase the K, but it's going to give this here. No sphere is going to take the red triangles and going to leave alone the brown points or the blue points, right? If here, if I write k-means, it's an absolute disaster. Because k-means will find balls. And even though you can magically find the best balls you can, those balls will never going to cluster these points correctly. So that's where you need that intuition of balls. If the data doesn't look like balls or Gaussians uh, stuff, k-means will never work on it. In here, the paint idea will work. Because everything that's similar, it's close to each other. If I put a paint can in here, it's going to color all these points by, by, by transitivity, right? Once colors this, colors that, colors that, so on and so forth, colors all these points. Because everybody has a neighbor that's close enough that has that color. But it will never cross this threshold boundary to color the other points, right? Because these brown points are too far away. So then I have to put the pan, the the can again on the brown ones and get these ones. Whenever I have density and nice boundary between densities, like in here, it's a clear boundary between the two clusters that I want, I could do any shape because the paint is just going to follow the shape of the data just like it did in the drawing, right? When I put the paint, it colored whatever shape I had in my drawing. I don't have a problem with shapes if I have enough density. The problem with this algorithm is that if I want to cluster things that are not linked properly, there's not enough density between them, the paint won't be able to advance. If I increase the threshold, it advances everywhere, it colors everything. How many people follow me here? Okay. So the k-means has the problem of shapes. It can deal with density fluctuations as long as data falls into those balls. The density has no problem with shapes. You can color any shapes. You can imagine any S, B, T, circles, whatever. As long as there's density in that thing and linkage from any red to any red, there's a way to go. And it, it's boundary, so you cannot jump to the other cluster. The paint can will solve this problem, independent of shapes. But it needs density. K means doesn't need density, but it needs shapes assumption. So K means, uh, let's see here what we I think the names in here are slightly different. So uh, naively, uh, I, I don't know why this is here, but naively speaking, if I have K clusters, how many mathematically, how many theoretically partitions can I create with N points and N clusters? K to the end, right? Because every point can go in any one of the K things, K times K times K. That's a very naive way to think about it. That would be a huge number, right? Like 20 to the power 70,000. That number does not exist in the universe. Uh, nobody would try to evaluate all possible clusterings. I mean, it, this slide is for like ninth grade people who say, if you're thinking to try all possibilities and see which one's the minimum here, that will never work because there are way too many possibilities. But I don't think you were thinking to do that. Uh, so nobody's going to try to say, OK, what are the total possible clusterings and evaluate all of them? That's why we need a EM-based algorithm. Uh, the memberships are called R, N, K. In here, I call them pi. The reason I call them pi is because next week, that's a very typical notation for mixtures. When you talk about mixtures, the probability in mixtures, it's always called pi. And I don't want to change the name, so it's called pi. Mu's are uh, the centers. And when we're going to talk about mixtures, who mu's going to be? The Gaussian means are going to be mu. You remember when we talk about Gaussians, yes. the mean is mu. And the variance of the standard deviation is sigma. So I call it, we call it mu so that when we go to soft clustering, we don't change the notation. 
Uh, this, I think, it's the thing that we put on the board right there, which is like the flotation membership stand distance. Now, in evaluation, we may not want to include, this is okay as a goal of K-means, as an objective while we go forward, but suppose now we're done. Somebody says we're done. We may not want to compute to evaluate against the means, because the means, it's computed by the algorithm. It's it's not really an outside notion. It's an inside notion to the algorithm. So we can modify this formula to say, I want something like, if I'm to modify it for evaluation purposes, just to see at the end how well it did. I could do some sort of sum for every pair of data points and all the clusters to say, if P, I, K, uh, it's equal to P, I, J, that's a predicate, P, J, K. If they fall in the same clusters, I don't want to use the means here for evaluation. I'm going to do some sort of distance between X, I minus X, J squared. Right? That's, I have to get out here, right? That's saying, if they're in the same cluster, I want small distances. It's not a complete formula we'll talk about next time. The problem with this evaluation is that it uses the means that are uh, part of the algorithm, not part of the data. So the slides are online. There'll be a homework probably posted on Wednesday or so, homework two, on clustering. And next week, Wednesday, we're going to talk more about this. Next week, we're going to talk about mixtures.